gonna, uh, I'm going to stay up here because I'm a bit far, far away from you, but I'm going to keep changing the PowerPoint, so um, that's a bit uh, difficult uh, anywhere else. Thanks so much for inviting me along. It's really kind of you. Um, I uh, have a great admiration for YMCA. I really truly do, and the Oasis does. In fact, our group chief executive, I'll explain what that means a bit later on, is Joy Materials. Yeah. Some of you will know Joy. And there's something about the way in which Oasis governance has developed across the last 10 years, which is uh, both, well, which is learning from the YMCA. Yeah. Do, do you know? So, in some points, it's. In, in some points, <laughs> in some places it's Joy's reaction to the YMCA. And, uh, and in some places, uh, it's, it's building on strengths that she saw. So, um, I, I, Joy talks to me quite often about the governance. <laughs> and, uh, and what we've learned and how we've grown and how we've done things, etc. etc. So I'll talk a little bit about that as I, as, um, I go through. Uh, actually, Oasis has, as its London headquarters, um, uh, a church building uh, right in Waterloo. It was called Christ Church, and then Christ Church and after itself called Oasis Church Waterloo. But we just can turn it into a school actually in September. Uh, secondary school, so it's going to have a secondary school, a church, a little bank, a food bank, a uh, debt advice centre, a cafe, um, so it's kind of school, church, um, community stuff, and um, uh, we've run for the last 20 years theological college, and um, for applied <coughs> theology, we're going to put that on the end as well, kind of little heart thing, I'll explain about that later, but um, the, the point is that um, George Williams was the um, was the church um, secretary of Christ Church, and uh, and uh, it was while he was church secretary of Christ Church that he had the idea of why was he going? Do you know he was walking? To, uh, the, the myth goes, I don't know, perhaps you know his story or not, um, over Blackfriars Bridge, and uh, because and, and that's where he came up with this idea, and uh, it was one of that that bunch of people that he was part of were an extraordinary gang who was so politically and socially engaged with a deep sense of spirituality. It was just an amazing um, opportunity for Oasis to become responsible for this building and try to build on, on some of its history. Anyway, there you go. So, let me tell you a little bit about Oasis, and that means I need to tell you a little bit about myself. All of telling you about Oasis and telling you about myself or anything else is only designed in this context for one uh, purpose. And it's to give you something um, to think about. So, uh, about in about 45 minutes, we're going to break into uh, groups around the tables and <coughs> debate and discuss the stuff that I've said and its relevance or not to the YMCA or anything else you might be involved in. And then, for the last little bit, come back and where you can should throw questions at me. And if there are things you disagree with and things that you think are short-sighted or narrow-minded or We've not really thought about it. You should pull all of those in as well, and I'll try to answer uh, your questions and observations as we go. So, fair enough? Yeah. So, first of all, a little bit about me. Um, I am half Indian, half English. My dad was Indian, he's died now, my mum is English. So, I'm, growing up, I was called a half caste. I mean, now they call it dual ethnicity and etc., etc., etc. But for all the years that mattered in my life, I was just a half caste. I grew up in South London. My dad was the darkest bloke I'd ever met, I think anybody had ever met, in our, uh, around South Norwood, because he was a uh, Southern Indian, very dark skinned, almost black. And I'm this colour, not because of the sun, I'm always this colour. Um, and, and the reason I tell you that was this he came from India, um, like many did, and couldn't get a job, and really struggled. And because he struggled, he finally got a job with London Transport, in a, uh, working in the canteen, and then discovered he uh, was allergic to flour. So um, that it gave that job up. And what happened was, therefore, as a kid, I'm the oldest uh, one of four, I watched what it was for someone who was, um, for someone who put his trust in the people who let him down. He'd come here to run the transport systems and he struggled. And I grew up in a household where we, we, we genuinely had very, very, very little. Oasis now works in education besides anything else, and we work with many kids in many struggling communities. But the, the upbringing I had was, was hugely deprived because he couldn't find work. And I tell you that story, uh, I hope you get the 
essence of it, why, I'll tell you in a little bit. When I was 14, I went to uh, I, I was going to school, which was called Davidson Secondary Model School. Davidson Secondary Model School was a school that you only went to if you were poor, um, as well as uh, you, you were thick and poor. If you were, if you were thick and rich, you, you paid for your kids to go somewhere else, or you got them somewhere else. You know what I mean? But this school, when you put on a Davidson Secondary Model badge, it would say, not only am I thick, my family is not connected to anyone who can change history in any sense. So I went to this really poor uh, school. Um, I, um, I spoke at an educational conference this morning, and I always felt awful speaking at educational conferences because I had no qualifications of any sort. Because when I went to this school, the first day, when we were 11, stood up, do you know year 7 as they call it now, first year as it was then, and they said, oh, Headmaster Mr. Jones stood on the stage and said, you're the kind of kid, kids, not just talking to me, who will never achieve anything with your heads. That was a, we'd only been in the building about 15 minutes. <laughs> you won't achieve anything with your heads. You're the kind of young people who will best work with your hands. And then he said this, we had no idea what he meant. He said, so you are going to be blue collar workers. Well, we were just wonderful. <laughs> we get blue collars. Yeah. <laughs> right, so I was never put in for any O levels um, because it was assumed that we'd all fail them anyway. I went to school where I never did one piece of homework ever because we were never set any. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? But then something happened to me when I was 14 that was utterly redemptive in my life. I fell in love with a girl who was called Mary Hooper. It's called now called Mary Beckham. And, and anyway, Mary was 15, I was 14, and she used to go to the youth club at the Baptist Church. That was important because she also went to Sandler's Grammar School for Girls in Croydon, this is. <coughs> and we were banned, our school was banned from even meeting outside the gates. I mean, no, Davidson Secondary Model School had such a reputation that we weren't allowed in the road where Selhurst Grammar School was. So the only way of seeing Mary Hooper was at the Baptist Church Youth Group at the at the uh, at one end of the Palace Hall Ground, the Holmesdale Road there, Holmesdale Road Baptist Church. So I started going there every Friday night just to ogle Mary. <laughs> I went week after week after week, religiously, every single week, every single week. And then one night, this happened. This is why Oasis exists. It was halfway through the evening, and my best friend, it's called Kit Gorin, he came over to me. He knew I fancied Mary. And he said, as 14 year olds do to their friends, he said, I've got some bad news for you. Two bits. I said, what are those, Kit? He said, bad news, number one, Mary Hooper does not fancy you. I know, because I've been talking to Bad news number two, she doesn't even know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> the impact of those two people was quite extraordinary. And um, that night, Friday night, I wandered home. I used to live at one end of the, the Palace Football Ground called White Horse Lane. My mum still lives there. The, the youth club was at the other end of the Palace Football Ground. So I wandered up the road um, that is as long as the, as long as the pitch, basically. And I started this journey, and though I didn't know these words then, you know, this was a moment of existential angst. So, um, who am I? What's the point? Mary doesn't want me. I might as well end it now. Life without Mary isn't life. My life in tatters at the age of 14. I'll never get down again, you know, all that kind of thing. About the halfway line, I began to perk up, because I think that type, kind of thing happens when you're 14. You know, you hit and up. And um, I began to think this, even if Mary Hooper doesn't fancy me, that youth club down at the church got a good story. In fact, they've got a better story about me than my school's got. And my school, they tell me I'm rubbish, useless, will never amount to anything. But down at the church, they tell me I'm made in the image of God. Like my life's got meaning and purpose, and I can achieve something. 
And I remember thinking this thought exactly. Well, even if Mary De Hooper doesn't fancy me, I'm going to choose the church's story over the school story. And I'm going to keep going. That was about a halfway line. The other bit, I can only make sense of by the story I told you about my dad and the discrimination I saw when I was a kid. Because on the other half of the journey, I thought, well, if it's true that God does exist and I'm going to keep going to that church, then it must also be true that everybody's made in God's image. So therefore, this is a slight leap here, I am going to set up, when I grow up, I'm going to set up a hostel which creates a place to be for young people who've been let down by anyone who should have trusted them and people who've told them terrible stories about who they are. I'm going to set up a hostel and I'm going to set up a hospital to give really great health care to people who need great health care who never counted for anything and I'm going to set up a school. And it's going to give education to kids who never thought they've got stuff like me. And I'm going to do all of this because I'm a Christian. So I got in, my dad got a job by then on British Road, he was a ticket collector at Normal Junction. And uh, my mum was in, she asked me how the evening would go, and I told her all this story. I said, and so I'm going to set up a school and a hostel and a hospital. And she looked at me, and she said, very nice. And it was the only piece of careers advice I had. <laughs> who 
are in our schools, or mums that bring their seven-year-olds to our schools, what is that? And they first say it's the Oasis badge, and then they say this, it's the circle of inclusion. It's the circle of inclusion. Oasis theme is inclusion. So we call this, sometimes you hear people in the Oasis talk about it as messy and or the circle of inclusion. It's messy because inclusion's always messy. It's messy because inclusion's many stranded. It's messy because inclusion is about the inclusion of the other who's unlike me. That value of inclusion, when you have outcomes that stem from it, which we believe stems from that thing that I thought going up that road um, when I was 14, outside Crystal Palace talking ground, everyone is made in the image of God. That theme is what we hope, wherever you cut Oasis, you know, like a stick of Brighton Rock, it will always, we always say we're inclusive. It drives us all the time. It drives us to make hard decisions. I was just talking to Peter about some public decisions I made about talking about sexuality and inclusion. Why do I do that? Do I fear that it could cost us loads of funding? Yeah. It could cost us millions of pounds of funding. Do I fear that we might fall out with some people who throw us out their organisations? Yeah. But we believe that every man and every woman is made in the image of God. That underpins who we are and that drives who we are. So every time uh, someone who's part of Oasis looks at that, or sees one of these giant hoes somewhere, or wears the badge, they know what they're wearing. Inclusion is messy. Inclusion is inclusion of the other. Inclusion is many stranded. And we know that this, this policy, this behavior, stems from a belief. A belief that every man and every woman is made in the image of God. We've developed several ethos. We've uh, this developed a whole amount of work around our ethos, which I'm not going to bore you with now because we take uh, uh, too much time, but we have five main ethos statements, inclusion being one of them, equality and diversity, transformation another, all springing out of this basic understanding that everyone is made in the image of God. And what we say to our staff uh, around the country, we probably employ more Muslims than Christians, OSS in the UK. More committed Muslims than we do committed Christians. We employ local cultural Christians, etc., etc. We say to all our staff, we say, we are never asking you to buy into OSS at the level of theology or belief. OSS is a Christian foundation. It's based on that story I've just told you. It's based on a set of core beliefs, which we come to uh, a little bit more in a moment. But we are asking you to buy in at the level of behaviour. <coughs> so you may not believe that every man and woman is made in the image of God. But we are asking you to commit to a behaviour of inclusion and equality and diversity. Our beliefs drive our behaviours. You need to know, I've said this to a group of people this morning actually, lovely group of people, you need to know that we didn't pull our behaviours out of thin air. Our ethos wasn't pulled down because some bald sat in London and said, hey, we're going to come up with five ethos statements, what can they be? And we all kind of wrote things down on you know, little notes, post-it notes, and choose the, the five most popular. Our Belief, our behaviours come from our belief structure, which is deeply embedded into what we are. It runs through us. We ask you to abide by the behaviours and policies that come out of our belief structure, but we don't ask you to abide into our belief structure. We find, actually, that it's an extraordinarily powerful tool um, with, people we work, uh, with people we work with. I was just talking to Paul, who's down there, uh, because uh, I, I sat uh, having lunch with Paul, which was brilliant, and uh, discovered that Paul works in Bradford. Oasis is beginning work in Bradford in September because there's a big school that Paul says he knows very well and that hasn't had a good relationship with at all because it's a very troubled school. 
Uh, it's called the Challenge College. It's in a place called Manningham. Manningham is probably the poorest or the poorest part of Bradford. It's 94% Muslim as schools intake. It's 4% Romani. It's 2% poor white working class. It's Muslim driven towards extremism by poverty. You know, uh, the school is massively troubled, um, massively troubled, and government simply said to Oasis, will you take this on? I remember standing in front of uh, a public meeting at, at Challenge College, it's going to be called Oasis Academy List of Park by, by September, but I remember standing in front of this group of parents, it was all men, the women don't come out often, the women don't leave the house, often women aren't allowed to leave the house, it's all men dressed in traditional Muslim clothing. And I was on a platform, and they were saying, why should this school, our school, come to you, a Christian organization, etc., etc. I mean, it was a, it was a, it, in fact, there was one or two Oasis staff with me at that who asked if they could leave study <laughs> and they actually went to um, uh, But actually, what happened was we talked together through that evening, and as I now, as I told them about inclusion, that Oasis believes that every man and woman is made in the image of God. Of course, this is a belief shared by every Muslim, that it's Abrahamic faith. And so I said, and so all of our beliefs and our behaviours will rise from this holy text that's ancient. And slowly, the whole atmosphere of the evening changed. It was amazing, because it was like a riot to start with. By the end of the evening, they voted that they wanted to be part of Oasis. And now asked us to engage with them in all sorts of ways. I met the Imam in Bradford and just going to have a meal with him in the next few weeks. They've asked for help in Islamic education around the, the town, etc., etc. But we are driven by that clear biblical understanding that underpins. Next thing I want to say before I move on is this that we've invested a lot in terms of theology and ethos. I know that one of your issues is governance, one of our issues is governance. What is Oasis? Oasis is a central model of governance. Um, we operate globally, nationally, regionally, and locally. We uh, work hard at ensuring that every decision is made as close to the ground as it possibly can. Never make a decision regionally that you should be making locally, etc, etc, etc. So at the centre, we are responsible for, uh, for governance and for vision. Um, and, so, and, and so we work hard at, um, at, if you like, the backroom services. So, if you come to Oasis in, in London or some of our regional centres now, you'll find big HR teams, uh, big finance teams, big IT teams, etc, um, etc. Et um, uh, we've got an estates team that looks after our buildings. So we do those backroom services, one or two others as well. But we also have a theology and ethos team. We think of Oasis centrally as an infrastructure organisation. We supply infrastructure. Uh, if, if I talk way outside of Oasis or, or, um, or the YMCA for a moment, I, I was asked recently to do something for the, the London Diocese, um, uh, Anglican Churches. So I went along to the leaders' breakfast and somebody stood up and they started up like this, I can't remember the figures. So they said, so we've got, we've got 1,200 staff, we've got 460 parishes, we've got 500 and what's it buildings. Let's, we are ready for mission. Uh, the, 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 the character of the country is changing. We're moving into an area where local authorities are uh, devolving assets to local groups. There are schools and there are libraries and there are children's centres and there are, you know, they went through this list of things that they were to do. And so let's equip our people for mission and go. Uh, and uh, I was the only non-Anglican invited to this uh, um, strategic breakfast, so I didn't say much, I just listened. And in the end, um, the bishop said to me, will you not say anything? And I said, well, I've really not got much to add. And he said, well, but say something. So I said, well, 
Two things I'd say. One, I'm a Baptist, which is not I'm not Anglican. So I take my hat off to any denomination that can organise a city-wide strategy in the first place. Because Baptists can't organise a church-wide strategy. They're like city, you know, they all work on their own. They're not doing that. So I say, applause from me to you for this attempt. It is fantastic. But I said, here's the thing. I'd like to reinterpret your figures. You've got 1,200 staff. They're mostly knackered. They're ill-equipped. They're not fit for purpose. They've not been trained. They're not resourced. They're not backed up. They don't understand the latest policy, and they're overwhelmed with baptisms, deaths, funerals, and marriages. They're wrung out because they're going to come up with another talk on Sunday. You've got 460 buildings. They're mostly falling down. They haven't got toilets in the right places. The lighting's wrong. They don't have disabled access. They don't have disabled toilets. They are unfit for purpose. You haven't got any of the backroom infrastructure. I said, I don't want to upset you, but you can't take over children's centres. And you'll never take over a library. Why? Because you can't tutor people. You don't have an agreement with the unions. You are not a, a, an admitted bo a, a body, a, a body with admitted status. You don't have a, 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 a finance infrastructure. All of your churches are doing their finances on a slightly out of date version of Excel. <laughs> It's a retired guy in his best moments giving you a bit of time, but you don't have a joined up infrastructure. You have no data systems. You can't manage your buildings. You don't know what your biggest risks are. You don't have a risk recovery plan. You don't have any of that in place. And I said, here's the funny thing. You could, because every person serving in every parish church they want to take on the library, but what they mean by taking on the library is we'd love to volunteer our time because we're early retired and we could go down there and arrange the books and we'd set up a coffee morning and do something for mums about preparing easy meals and we'd advertise it in the school and we'd do something for <coughs> dads on this and that we'd set up these clubs and we'd increase football and then that's the bit churches can do but they can only do that if you've got the central infrastructure in place to drive this in the first place because until you can do the tuping, until you can do the union negotiations until you have a national agreement with the unions you're never going to be in a place where they're ever going to give you one library ever full stop end of story Fourth. so the London Diocese should become an infrastructure organisation to equip the churches within it to do what they can do and what you can't. That, by the way, is what I believe the Baptist Union should become. I am a Baptist. That's what Oasis sees itself as. Centrally, we are an infrastructure organisation creating the resources to release entrepreneurs in localities around Britain. We work in just over centres, so you know, just on a half the size of the, the, the areas that you work in. But we are there guiding, creating accountability, releasing people uh, to, to, to do what they want. As, for instance, schools have joined us, children's centres have joined us, um, we run community parks, cafes, we run leisure centres, and all sorts. We find time and time again, people will say to us, coming in, stupid in, if you like, I've, they say this all the time, I've never felt more accountable and I've never felt more set free. The difficulty is the accountability until you realise the accountability is the very thing that sets you free to fly. So we find uh, school teachers, heads, all the time, who they come and they become part of Oasis, so they've not got to think about insurances on buildings. They've not got to think about policies anymore. They've not got to think about HR anymore. They've not got to think about demographics anymore. They've not got to think about building extensions anymore. They've not got to think about what to do with the boiler that goes down anymore. They've not got to think about union negotiations anymore. They are set free to teach. So you get a better job on the ground because you get it in the centre. Does that, does, that, does that make sense? So, um, I'll move on. Um, 
What Oasis always does is this. this is, uh, I don't go for, uh, you can't see these colours very well, but this is um, Oasis Hub Bolden. Uh, what Oasis always does is it works in a hub. Now, the problem with the word hub is everybody's a hub. Now, I was uh, in my local pub the other week, and Richard, who's the manager, told me that the pub is becoming a hub. So that's very nice. So hub can mean anything to anyone. What we mean is this. If every person is making the image of God, our task is to create, for, to create well-being with them, not for them, but with them. We believe that every person matters, and the whole person matters in the whole context of their whole life and their whole community. And therefore, if you take uh, one of the hub, the Oasis hub I work in, is in Waterloo. So the Oasis hub in Waterloo, we run the primary school, we run, we run, a, well actually we run a mothers and toddlers drop in, it's called Colour Blue, we run a nursery, we run a primary school, we just set it up the secondary school, we run some football teams, we run a church, we run a community cafe, we run some drop-in, uh, we run some uh, 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 managed office space for businesses, we run etc, uh, etc. Et we run a test advice centre, we run a food bank, we just set it up, a community bank, a credit union, um, uh, we're just in conversations with the local authority about taking on the library. Um, uh, we've talked to, been talking to them for two years. In the last week, they've come back to us and said, "Will you do that?" We've just been in negotiation about becoming responsible for the local park. We're just going to build um, a 3G, um, as, you know, a, a football pitch and manage that, and some tennis courts, etc., etc. Why do we do all these things? We're involved in lots in, we run several community choirs, we're involved in uh, adult literacy, adult numeracy. Um, what, now all of that, we've been working in this area for well over a decade, that we've built this kind of stuff. But that is an outworking of what we believe about inclusion. It's for everyone, everyone's in. We don't take to count people out, we count them in, however far out they are, we try and work with them to pull them in etc, etc, to meet the needs in their life. If we're going to get our, our um, stage one uh, uh, um, and stage two, uh, level one and level two SAT results, you know the SAT results, if those who are into primary education, just being released now. If those SAT results are going to go up, if those little kids are going to read better, they're going to read better if they read with their mother. Their mother, do you know if a mother, all the research shows that if a mother reads with her child, some of the, the research varies depending on which university it comes from. But some universities, you, some research says, if a mother reads to a child in the evening, that reading has three times more power than any other reading with any other person on earth. Some research suggests that that reading has six times more power. But who knows? What we do know is that if a mother sits a child on her knee, and wraps her arm around that child and reads through a book. There's a lot more going on than literacy there. The fact is, how will a kid get through their sacks and keep their reading level up if their mum has been more down on if their mum can't read, if their mum's been punched and kicked around? How will that child fare if that mum has a low sense of self-esteem and is looking for love in all the wrong places, how will that child fare in terms of their reading output if the mum is terrified because she's got a red letter from the electricity company and a loan shark's knocking at her door? Therefore, the food bank, the debt advice centre, the, the, the community bank, the popping cafe, the opportunity for employment, or we, we, we coach people in their CVs, etc., etc. All of those things, though they do not seem to, uh, forgive me saying this, to Michael Gove, to be anything to do with education, actually are, in essence, at the centre of education. The whole person, in the whole context of their whole life, in the whole context of the whole community. That's what an Oasis Hub is. Of the 40 hubs or so we run, each one is different.
because each one is a response to its own community. Each one is based on what's already in the community. This isn't Oasis trying to run everything, it's Oasis working in partnership. So for instance in Southampton we run two hubs, one on the west side of the city, one on the east side of the city, and both we work really closely with the YMCA. In fact, when we were given the opportunity by uh, um, uh, Southampton City Council, uh, half a decade more than that, to take these schools on, we went to the YMCA and asked the YMCA to be part of our bid, and the YMCA delivers a huge amount of the wraparound care, the after school, before school, in the holidays, at the weekends, care and resources that we need in both places. In one of those places, with some help from the local YMCA, we run a community farm. You know, it's so it's you're forever saying, what have, does this is this community looking for, and what can we add to create inclusion? Um, uh, can you see that? The, you know, I think, well, I'll have to guide you through this. Um, I'll, I'll flick off it because you're uh, just for a moment. I'll flick off it for just for a moment. Um,
more than anybody else. They've received the bad offsteads, they've received the bad knocks from parents, they go to the angry meetings, they know what's wrong. Our job is to sit down with that staff and say, so this is where you are, where do you want to be? And they set their goals, they set their uh, KPIs, they set their targets. Our job regionally is just to come back and hold them to account for what they've said they will do. Not to impose on them something from us. Does that make sense? So, nationally goals and vision are set. Locally, therefore, a local hub will set its mission and values. In uh, Waterloo, uh, there's a leader of the secondary school, a leader of the church, there's a leader of the, the primary school, there's a leader of the football league, there's a leader of the cafe, <laughs> there's a leader of the theological college that we run in Waterloo, there's a leader of, there's lots of leaders, and all of those leaders get together, and together we form the local hub leadership team. And we set a Waterloo uh, mission and values which is our words, our way of talking about what we're doing in Waterloo, and we know whether we're, we, we're hitting that uh, nerve, is does it resonate with all of this? We can say whatever we like, use our own creativity, be as entrepreneurial as we like, but does it resonate back with this? Does that make sense? And then, each specific project sets its mission and value. So if you talk to our um, secondary school, they have this thing they call climbing the stairs to excellence and S-T-A-I-R-S uh, uh, all of these, you know, all of these letters stand for stand for equality that's built into the secondary education. Now, if you go to the primary school, they say it completely differently. If you go to um, the, the cafe, they say it completely differently again. But it's what they do. And then that begins to emerge above the sea line. Uh, the water line, and people begin to see uh, what's happening. And what Oasis does nationally and globally is hold everyone to account. So in all our 40 something hubs, twice a year we have a strategic review. So what will happen is a team uh, that's made up from people from other hubs, so it's a peer mentoring thing. Sense. So people from other hubs and single people will come to Oldham and they sit down with Oldham and they talk to Oldham about their goals, their targets, their mission, their values and, their, and together we will assess and hold that hub accountable for what it's delivering against the goals that it set in the first place. But because it's a peer mentoring system, of course, everyone's, everyone's uh, monitored by everyone else. We're learning uh, from one another as, as we go. And then this thing running up the centre, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. And then, uh, I'm sorry I've talked for so long, I just wanted to... Uh, we wanted to address the issue of how it is, how it is that when all the donors came into the school, what he gets isn't what, you know, it says on the team. We want to address the issue of, if you're a teacher working for us, or a youth worker on a youth project, and you're deciding to do a musical at Christmas, or you're putting on an art show, or whatever, how do you know which pantomime to choose? How do you know which event to put on? How do you know which competition to run? How do you know which staff member to choose? How do you know who to appoint? So what we do is we say, this is our decision-making tool, and we appoint people, we choose projects against this, when you've decided to do your sexualized dance, how does it relate to this? It's the decision-making tool. But, but up the middle of this volcanic iceberg run, there are four words you won't be able to see that it says hubs, rabbi, yadda, and shalom. And they poke out the top. Uh, here's yadda. This is part of what we say to all our kids. Yadda is the Hebrew word, as I'm sure you know by now. You can see that there for, for knowledge. Uh, Abraham knew God, Adam knew Eve, same word, yada. Adam yadded Eve, and, they, and she bore a son. Abraham yadded God, and had a relationship with him. In other words, in Hebrew, knowledge is always in the context of relationship. You can't know things unless you're involved in relationship. It's experimental. What we're saying about the education that we bring to everyone, that it's always experimental, it's always engaged, it's not gnosis. Gnosis 
is the green form of knowledge which we bought into in the UK and actually much has been bought into the UK, Cambridge now. Cambridge, Oxford, etc. following the German model of research. Do you know it's called the research ideal? Do you, you know, before the Enlightenment, when, when this college, this wonderful college you were talking about, the 1300s one was set up, what could you go there to study? Yeah. Wasn't any of those things. When in all of these colleges were set up, what could you study in them? Do you know? Theology. Yeah, you, yeah, ask them to know. You can only study one thing, theology, in all of them. But it wasn't theology as we know it. It was life. You came here to train for life. You know you say, I'm going up to Cambridge. Do you know that phrase? Well, what, what, well, that's okay if you live in Eastbourne, but what if you live in, what if you live in Glasgow? Why do you say I'm going up to Cambridge if you live in Glasgow? Because going up to Cambridge or Oxford or Harvard or Yale um, or Princeton was about going up the mountain. You know Jesus went up, um, he went up the Mount of Transfiguration and he reflected the mountaintop experience and then he went down the disciples said, let's stay here. And he said, no, 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 we've got to go down and get on with it. Martin Luther King recaptures this, of course, in his great speech, I've been to the mountaintop. The phrase going up to Cambridge <coughs> comes from the same place. You go up to reflect and to ponder life and who you are, and then you go down to living. You go down into your ministry, your vocation, your calling. The Germans, in the 18th century, um, the uh, uh, Enlightenment, uh, the European Enlightenment. The, the epicenter of the Enlightenment was Germany. The epicenter of Germany was uh, Berlin. You know, the Enlightenment was all that matters is what's empirical. You know, what you can see and count, research, research, research. And so the fir first time ever, I promise you this is true, the idea of research degree became available. So you went to uh, some of the Berlin institutes and you did a research degree, which wasn't, you see, if you go to the colleges here, it was about, the, but it was broad, it encompassed everything, it was about life, it was about broad study for life. But Germany developed the idea of a narrow knowledge. You went and you researched uh, neutrons. You, know, you went and you researched string theory. You see, so you knew everything there was to know about that. It was deep and narrow, but it was deep and narrow. And, and Germany became the leading nation, uh, but the brightest nation in the world. And then something terrible happened at the Second World War, First and Second World War. Here's the thing, you're not out on your television now, but you still know about this. German cars are still advertised by the quality of their engineering, the best engineers in the world. But Germany had the best research engineers and scientists and medics in the world. And the problem was the best engineers in the world used all their engineering prowess to build the incinerators at Auschwitz. And the best medics in the world used their knowledge to design the eugenics program. Which is why when I went and did the which I eventually did, some of you may have done theology, all I studied for four years of doing theology was dead Germans. <laughs> That's it. Is that not true? Theology? 20th century theology, anybody do that? 20th century theology, who wrote all the theology books? Who wrote all the philosophy books? The Germans, with a few Americans chucked in and the occasional Englishman. It's basically the Germans who led 20th century theology and, and, and philosophy. Why did they do it? Because they had just, they were recovering from the shock of the Holocaust. It drove them back to do theology and philosophy in a new way. How come we were intellectual giants and moral pygmies all in the same moment? And you did the German philosophy, 20th century philosophy, and and theology is a reimagining of who we are. Because they've forgotten what Yadda was. Uh, um, a guy called Polanski, who was a, a, a German engineer, did some study here and then moved to Manchester. And he talks about, he calls it elbow knowledge. But it, it, what he's really saying is, you can't sit in a lab and really get bright. You, you can't go and sit in a, in a, you can't go and sit in a library for three years and come out wise. 
You can come out with a PhD, but you can't come out with wisdom. Because Yadda insists that wisdom is about our relationships and experimentation and doing stuff. That creates uh, what's called deep knowledge rather than shallow knowledge. Are you into all of that kind of thinking? Do you know? Shallow knowledge, uh, uh, funnily enough, shallow knowledge is what's on University Challenge. You know? And on uh, Mastermind, it's all shallow knowledge. You know, isn't it? So it, go it, goes like, it goes like this, doesn't it? In, in 1583, on July the 28th, what happened? You go, <laughs> and then somebody with a Daryl Bar Barrel surname who goes to Jesus College goes, yeah, and he knows the answer. And you go, genius! <laughs> but it's not genius. It's just good memory of information. That's called shallow knowledge. John Westburn, right that they go there. There's lots of research done around that. Shallow knowledge. Shallow knowledge is when I learn stuff, when I learn facts and figures and information, what can I best do with it? Regurgitate it. So, shallow knowledge, how many disciples did Jesus have? What were the names of the disciples? How many tribes were there in Israel? Who was Moses' wife? All of these things are wonderful. And what are they good for? Winning around at a pub quiz. They're as really good. But they're not good for anything else. They're shallow knowledge, not deep knowledge, not wisdom. Yada is about deep knowledge. And what we're saying in all our hearts is we're about creating deep knowledge in people. Does that make sense? Um, the second thing we say, so we say to all our teachers, all our youth workers, is yada, yada, yada. Yada. That's what, we, what we've got to be creating. Wisdom for life. I often say, because uh, I, I work in Waterloo, often in and out of Parliament, as part of my job. I was in Parliament yesterday and I was talking about education to uh, 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 someone uh, uh, there. And uh, so, oh, but I didn't say this yesterday, I often do. You know, the thing is, don't want to upset anyone, but you know, you can go into the bar, or the green bar, or the red bar, you know, the laws of the commons. You go into the green bar, or the red bar in the evening, and you can sit there, you know, for a meeting. And somebody that you've seen on the telly, on question time, and all that comes in, they sit in the corner, they have a drink, and they have another drink, and they have another drink. You see people avoiding them because they know it's been a bit nauseous. And they sit there, and you finish your meeting, and you wander away and stand up drinks. Why are they there? They've got nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. They're washed up, they're alone, they're 40 something. Here's the thing they've all got, this is what I say to politicians, they've all got five key stars to see, including maths and English and Jesus. <laughs> Everything in place, nothing missing, socially, 
individually, family-wise, community-wise, nationally, globally. Shalom even has notions of a cosmic piece in it. Everything in place, educationally, environmentally, spiritually, etc., etc. So we say all our stuff, these are the things that we're about. And this fits into our, our decision-making thing. See, it says, hugs, rabbi, yetha, shalom. Driven by our core beliefs, what's our core mission? How do we deliver that locally? And how do we create an atmosphere filled by shalom? An atmosphere of well-being. That's what Oasis is, and that's how it operates. And I should shut up and let you turn around and talk to one another.